funding for the WVIZ PBS Idea Stream production of the Annisfield Wolf Book Awards 2020 was provided by the Cleveland Foundation. All right. Hello, Ilya. Hello. I'm very proud of you. Thank you. Hey, Charles, how you doing? My hey, man? how are you? Great. Hey, Nam Wally. You're on mute. <laughs> how, how are, are you? you? I'm, I'm good. I'm fine. Dr. Fona. Yep, we're, uh, yeah, I miss uh, seeing you now and then, like in the good old days. We we're all stuck in our home. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, countdown, three, two, one. It's my honor to welcome you to the 2020 version of the Annisfield Wolf Book Awards. <laughs> I'm Henry Louis Gates Jr. and I have the pleasure and the privilege of being the chair of the jury of the Annisfield Wolf Book Awards. It's my great uh, joy to join you in Cleveland once again this year. I'm so sorry that we can't be together in Cleveland tonight. This year's ceremony certainly looks a little different than what we so enjoy each year. But there's several things that haven't changed at all. First of all, the Annisfield Wolf Book Awards still allow us to honor great writers and great works that have contributed to our understanding of racism and diversity with excellence. In a year in which these issues have never been more critical, Later, we're going to have the pleasure of visiting these writers in their homes. Also unchanged, the dedicated leadership of Ron Richard, president and CEO of the Cleveland Foundation, and the tireless efforts of Karen Long and her exquisite team to bring this ceremony to fruition despite the peculiar challenges posed by all that we face this year. Now let's take a look back at the roots of this prestigious award. The Annisfield Wolf Collection is housed here at the Cleveland Public Library in Special Collections. We collected all the books from the awards since the 1930s up to the current date. And we have some beautiful titles. There are quite a few notable names. Toni Morrison, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Jill Lepore, Langston Hughes, Nadine Gormer. Oh, it's a list. It's a glory of a list. The Edmondsville Wolf Book Awards came to fruition because of the philanthropy of Edith. She was already an established poet, very involved with the Cleveland Public Library. And she decided that literature was a very effective tool for talking about the problem of racial discrimination. So in 1935, she created what was known as the Annisfield Prize. She was very specific that she wanted to celebrate writing that showcased diversity. Over the past 85 years, the group of winners have been responsible for the publication of much of the significant work on the issue of race and racism. And that would be notable in itself, but what's even more remarkable is how often the winners are chosen early in their careers. We discovered books that, you know, we said, where did this person come from? We have no idea, but they write like an angel. <laughs> Trying to convince people of a shared humanity across the barriers of race, religion, politics, I, I can't imagine that it, there's ever been a time that was more critical than today. And she had this vision from the beginning that it would be possible to build bridges between people using the power of the word. And right now, that seems like an urgent task. This award is more important than ever to remind us of who we are and why we are. Charles, my man. How has COVID uh, and sheltering in affected you? 
yeah, I think like a lot of us, uh, we felt kind of in suspended animation here for a while. My wife and I live on Capitol Hill on June 1st when the, the Battle of Lafayette Square was, uh, was raging. Um, you know, we were buzzed by helicopters. It felt like every few minutes. Both of us who spent time in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union, who it felt like we were suddenly in a very different country from the one we had, we had imagined. In Gods of the Upper Air, Charles King departs from his celebrated scholarship on nationalism, ethnic politics, and urban history to excavate a fascinating account of four influential American women anthropologists. Undertaking research under the tutelage of pioneering male social scientist Franz Boas, research that refuted the faux science of scientific racism, these path-breaking women revolutionized not only ideas of race, but also prevailing notions of sex and gender. Yet Gods of the Upper Air isn't just a history of the struggle, quote, to prove that despite the differences in skin color, gender, ability, or custom, humanity is one undivided thing, unquote. As the Washington Post points out, and I quote, the lives of Boaz and his students make for riveting storytelling, and the author's imaginative prose enlightens their discoveries. The title of King's book is taken from Zora Neale Hurston's Dust Tracks on a Road, which itself won an Annisfield Wolf Book Award in 1943. Hurston, it also happens, was one of these four renegades. All of Boaz's students lived richly and remarkably independent lives, though they met with varying degrees of success in their lifetime. Margaret Mead and Ruth Benedict's scholarship earned them places as influential intellectuals whose works appeared on college syllabi throughout the 20th century. Herson's research in African-American folklore led directly to her great masterpiece of American fiction, the novel, Their Eyes Were Watching God. But this novel and Herson herself were kept from the American canon until the late 1970s and the 1980s. Ella Cara Deloria is now known under her own name and by her Dakota name, which means Beautiful Day Woman, for her contributions to our understanding of the language and culture of the Dakota Sioux. In 1941, the linguistic tour de force Dakota Grammar, to which her research and cultural knowledge were invaluable, was published under her name, second to that of Franz Boas. Both Deloria and Hurston died in penury and in relative obscurity. In their own time, Mead, Benedict, Deloria, and Hurston were often characterized as being deviant, unnatural, and of course, unpatriotic. Over many decades, reactionary thinkers have maintained these types of critiques. And we know sadly that scientific racism, quote unquote, still has galling currency in the current culture wars as a rear guard action to justify white supremacy. Gods of the Upper Air provides a critically important and richly informed frame to consider the life and work of these groundbreaking anthropologists who are dedicated to disproving scientific racism. Indeed, they disproved it with their very existence. For his timely, compelling, and moving portrait of the women whose research revolutionized the way we view the world, Charles King is the recipient of this year's Annisfield Wolf Book Award for nonfiction. We recently visited Charles at his home in Washington, D.C. So this is the Jefferson Building of the Library of Congress here in Washington on Capitol Hill. And as you were walking in, you would come almost face to face with the racial hierarchy as Americans understood it in the 1890s. We had carved it in stone on our most important institution of knowledge. You'll see wrapped around the building 33 ethnographic heads from designs taken from the Smithsonian's collections. The people on the front of the building are of recognizably European heritage, white people. 
Around the sides, people of recognizably Asian heritage appear as the keystones. And on the back of the building, people of recognizably African and Melanesian descent. In the greatest institution of human knowledge in the United States and the greatest library in the world, we had placed the ranking of races as we understood it there for everybody to see it. And in walking into the Library of Congress still today, you're taking a kind of museum trip through the racial hierarchy of American history. Franz Boas came to the United States in the 1880s. The science of the day, of his day, was saying, well, humans come in natural things called races, and those races correlate with things like intelligence or leadership skill or fitness for civilization or being world conquering versus primitive and backward. But Boaz spent the early part of his career trying to set out to be what we might call an amateur adventurer. Spent some time on Baffin Island in the Arctic where he had his first realization. He was well educated, he had a graduate degree, but in living in the Arctic with local Inuit populations, he realized that here he was pretty stupid. He didn't know what to eat. He didn't know how to survive. He didn't know how to harness a dog sled team. I mean, who doesn't know how to harness a dog sled team, right? You have to be really stupid not to know that. And this ended up being the first step in what was a long personal transformation for him. All education is relative. All concepts of civilization are relative because here, now, I turn out to be not even a fully grown human being. And so much of the kind of social theory that he then begins to develop is, you know, a science of human unity. Boaz himself was not a very charismatic figure personally, but I think as soon as you took a class with him or sat in his seminar room, you realized that the ideas he was talking about were kind of world upending. Herson is drawn into the Boaz circle in the same way that Margaret Mead and others are, I think principally attracted by the ideas. Boaz realized that you have to demonstrate the essential unity of human beings, and the way you do that it's really quite simple, he said. Step outside your front door. And what you're gonna find is not the simple idea that everybody's the same, but you might encounter the idea that people who seem to be deviant in your own society turn out to be the village chieftain in another society. So you ought to be skeptical about the degree to which the natural categories that seem logical and commonsensical to you are universal. And be particularly skeptical if your theory of human society just happens to put people like you at the top of the pile. Certainly having the resources here in Washington, I couldn't have done this book in exactly the same way had I not been so close to so much of what I needed. It relied so much on the Margaret Mead papers, which are at the Library of Congress. Well, I struggled a bit in the project on how much of their personal lives to include, but I realized at some point that their personal lives were really an important part of the story. All of them had essentially the same realization, that the struggles they were facing need in this loving relationship that had to be kept secret. Zora Neale Hurston is the only African-American student at Barnard at the time. Franz Boas is a German-Jewish immigrant at the time of anti-immigrant backlash. The struggles they faced could either be attributed to their own defects. You know, there's something deviant about me that is causing me to have the problems in life I'm having. Or there's something about the way I fit into the social categories, the norms, the culture, if you want to call it that, of the time and place into which I happen by chance to have been born. And from that realization springs an entire social theory. 
Franz Boas changed our culture's understanding of superiority and inferiority of various peoples, the rootedness of behavior in biological differences, the uh, uh, unchangeability of uh, habits and customs and institutions in advanced civilizations. He changed all of these, but he also, by example, launched the careers of uh, women and African Americans in an era in which that was still a rarity. So it's an extraordinary chapter in intellectual history. In so many areas of life, the worldview that Boaz and his students were advocating has won out. On the other hand, none of this is finished. They would have understood the struggle. They would have understood the constant seduction of the idea of our own specialness. So I think, you know, one of the lessons is that the route to a moral life is through an understanding of the multiplicity of human cultures. And that's, for them, the only route. I started the book with two quotes, one from Hurston and one from the physicist Max Planck. So Hurston writes, I do not say that my conclusions about anything are true for the universe, but I have lived in many ways, sweet and bitter, and they feel right for me. I've walked in storms with a crown of clouds about my head and the zigzag lightning playing through my fingers. The gods of the upper air have uncovered their faces to my eyes. That's where my title comes from. And Planck says, a new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die and a new generation grows up that is familiar with it. And I think both of them are speaking to a similar kind of, kind of issue, that to the degree that we have progress in the sciences and the social sciences, to the degree our worldview changes, it's not because people make an argument and then convince people and suddenly they, you know, through this rational process of transforming your view of the world, but through the slow accretion of a different kind of common sense. You have to shift your normal. Now, Molly, how has this year affected you other than um, your uh, removal from the University of California at Berkeley to uh, Harvard, I think? In a lot of ways, my life has not changed that much, that, <laughs> and my work hasn't changed that much either. I spend a lot of time thinking and writing about questions of power. My novel, The Old Drift, is very much about that. The Old Drift, Namwali Serpel's 2019 debut novel, amassed heaps of praise. Is a best first novel, a most anticipated novel, the work of a writer to watch, as ambitious as any first novel published this decade in the words of Dwight Garner of the New York Times. So you get the idea. Launched into the literary stratosphere by this first novel, which in fact had been preceded by lauded essays in the New Yorker and the New York Review of Books, Namali Serpel's ascendance came as no surprise to me. She was my brilliant graduate student at Harvard. And she's now my newest colleague in the Department of English at Harvard. The power and authority of the old drift, a multi-generational novel set in Zambia, urges us to reach for comparisons to an impressive array of predecessors, including Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Zadie Smith, and Salman Rushdie. Serpel traces three families through three generations over the course of a century in which Zambia emerged from colonialism into independence, defining its new engagement with the world through technology as well as revolution. Serpel follows the family's individual paths and their blended ones and helpfully provides, much to my delight, their family trees. The elements of magical realism and speculative fiction are all there, and Serpel, like her literary peers, defies the limitations of time, space, and genre. Much has been written about the mosquito chorus that narrates human history in the novel. 
It's a device straight out of epic and of science fiction. For me, it serves to draw human history literally from the blood of generations, both skewering and amplifying the idea that human beings are of one blood. An epic story on a human scale, the novel asks us both to understand and imagine how individuals make a nation and how a nation makes individuals. And it asks us to think about the difference between holding together and falling apart. Sir Pell dares to imagine an Africa that can be seen as a model, a template, a source for the rest of the world, reminiscent perhaps of how humanity itself emerged out of Africa. She dares to imagine a Zambia, an Africa that engenders rather than is subsumed, that is comprehensible rather than scrambled, that is often whole rather than only broken. In the old drift, Themes and artifacts of history are all particular to individuals, but also are ultimately shared in the weave of familial allegiance, national identity, and global citizenship. At the end of the novel, the Mosquito Chorus, having now evolved into micro-drones, begin to question their own identity. Who are we really? For her searching and cosmic exploration of these questions of identity, of how we exist as both whole and parts of a whole. Now, Mwali Serpel is the recipient of the 2020 Annis Field Wolf Book Award for Fiction. Now, Mwali moved to New York City recently, but we talked to her earlier this year in San Francisco. I tend to work at, at times of day when most people are like napping or eating. <laughs> so like basically brunch through early afternoon are my prime writing times. I like to feel like a little drowsy. <laughs> For a lot of writers, style is a brand. And this is how you come to be known as having a particular style. What I want to be known for, rather, is having an interest in and a really broad democratic embrace of many styles and of many genres. I started writing The Old Drift in my last year of college. I had gotten into a creative writing course, and the first chapter that I wrote was about a woman who cries all the time, so often and for so long that it actually starts to wear her, her body down. I wrote about her and her daughter and her grandson. And so the first family were the Mwambas. Each of those characters came to me in a different genre. It plays with magical realism or fable-like, almost gothic tales. So Matha cries all the time and her daughter doesn't. Then there's a social realism section and her daughter responds to her mother's heartbroken quality by trying to be very cynical about love instead and she actually becomes a sex worker. And her son responds to his mother's absence of affection by basically wanting to escape and he becomes obsessed with flying things. So he was always very interested in science and engineering. And so the science fictional aspect was already tied to him. But I wanted to see, well, what is it like when you have a woman who is magical realist next to her science fictional child? I remember when I presented the chapter in a creative writing workshop as an undergraduate, everyone was really confused. Like, how can you have these three characters in different genres? And they, they just kind of came to me that way. We have always a number of very interesting novels that we consider for the Anisfield Wolf Award, but this seemed to us the most ambitious and exciting. And I was suggesting the variety of tone and voice, which is most unusual. Many novels are in one voice. There's a lot of fiction about African immigrants in countries in the West. 
And I had always wanted to write about Zambia specifically, and I wanted to write about immigration to Zambia to actually give a picture of Zambia from a positive perspective, not as a negative space from which people leave and from which things are taken, but a place to which people come and stay and build and synthesize and syncretize their cultures. In the remote villages in the forest, life goes on as it has for centuries. And we can watch the placid communal life of the village. There are ways to tell the story of an African nation that elide the white gaze. For me, the way to try to sh change the frame is very often by flipping stereotypes on their head. So by having the immigrant population be the white people who came to Zambia, by having certain stereotypes that you would associate with Africans actually be attributed to the white people. In terms of being able to take on the perspectives of multiple people, I think that this is the writer's job. It's really hard, but it is the task. Being able to take on the perspective of a historical figure is as marked a difference as taking on the perspective of someone of a different race. The story of colonialism is very much how Zambia came into being as a country, as a nation. And I chose to use Percy's own words. He wrote a memoir called The Autobiography of an Old Drifter. And that chapter is almost entirely made up of his language. When I was reading his autobiography, I felt so charmed and so engaged by him and felt such shock when I reached the first racial epithet. And I wanted to replicate that for the reader. The impact of a black reader from that part of the world reading an account of a British man coming to Africa to make his fortunes, but being just completely incapable of seeing the African people around him as human beings. It was such a shock for me. I did hesitate about starting a book with the white colonialist, but I felt if you get to the end of the book, you can see an arc. Um, you can see where I'm going with, with what it means to, to build a nation and what it means to live in one, to survive it. This part of the story is about a young girl named Sibylla who is born covered in hair that continually grows and grows and grows and she has to trim it every day, essentially, to be able to move around. Um, the hair from her head, but also the hair from her face and her body are long enough that they can sweep the ground. And this part of the story describes when she sneaks into a party. The old woman grinned back, her teeth stuck as gravestones in the expanse of gum. Then she took Sibylla's arm and began to dance. At first, Sibylla went along with the marionette movements of reluctance, jerk, sway, jerk, sway, waiting for an opportune moment to let go. But then someone else grabbed her other arm. It was the pretty card counter with the blue dress and the copper curls. The women danced, passing Sibylla between them. Her feet scraped, then tapped, then bounced against the floor, and soon enough, she was bounding along, drawing near one dance partner, then the other, letting them spin her. The colonel took notice and began to clap loudly to the beat from his seat. The sergeant leaned against a wall, his wine glass pressed to his collarbone. Sibylla could see. Whenever she spun, her hair would whirl up and out from her body, dissipating into a mist of suspended strands. The music jiggled and jumped. Sibylla spun and spun. A vortex seemed to deepen and clarify in her belly, as if this was simply the natural acceleration of a spinning that had always been inside her. The party guests circled her, clapping in time. The ends of her hair thudded across corduroy, whispered across satin, pitted against badges. Splotches of faces bloomed towards her and wilted away. 
She caught a glimpse of Signora Lina's scowling face, and just then the spinning started to feel uncontrolled. Sibylla was no longer turning in place, she was orbiting a lopsided loop in the center of the room. But how to stop? Sibylla closed her eyes. Between spinning and stopping was a chasm, how to cross it? She heard dilating laughter and tumbling music. Only a plunge of nausea told her that she had finally stopped. Ilya, how about you? How has um, this year since the, uh, well, the shutdown of uh, America, really, um, how's that affected your work? The question you asked, and the question every poet has asked himself since March or before, um, what does it mean to be a poet in this moment of crisis, in a time of crisis? Uh, what is poetry for such a moment? Everybody is a really masked and I only communicate by within lips. So mm -hmm. you might have that kind of situation. And uh, that brings me back to the question of what it is to be a disabled person in America. Uh, what it means to realize that disabled body doesn't just belong to the realm of the hospital, but to the realm of political minority. Born in Ukraine to a Jewish family in 1977, Ilya Kaminsky lost most of his hearing to a misdiagnosed case of the mumps. It was not until age 16 when his family was granted political asylum in the United States, that he was finally fitted with effective hearing aids. Knowing no English, Kaminsky began learning his fourth language after Russian, Ukrainian, and sign language shortly after the death of his father. In an interview with The Guardian, he recounts his fascination with, quote, what happens to language in a time of crisis, how we carry on and how we try to remain human, unquote. Throughout Deaf Republic, communication is not only oral, but visual, with pictograms inserted into the text to represent sign language. While most of the poems in this collection narrate life after the totalitarian takeover of a town called Vasenka, Kaminsky's imagined stage, the frame poems that bracket this play insist on the American genesis of the collection. The parable Deaf Republic presents is both beautiful and damning. Life and death on the margins matter profoundly and tell the story of our nation. Between Kaminsky's frame poems, the poet brilliantly presents a world in which deafness is a choice, an act of defiance by the townspeople of an occupied village following the murder of a deaf boy in the public square. The townspeople, however, continued to communicate among themselves through sign language, as they tried to create a language not known to authorities. Within this catastrophic silence, life goes on, with love and birth all taking their place in the narrative, all forms of resistance to a totalizing, dehumanizing, violent regime. In Deaf Republic's second act, resistance is defeated, but we can't say that it proves futile. Silence can serve as both rebellion and as a fearful failure to act. These are the poles between which a community under threat navigates. Kaminsky's ability to create such a rich landscape in only 60 lyric poems has led to a full-throated chorus of praise, judging it to be a contemporary epic and a work of genius for his timely and beautiful Jeremiah and for his devastatingly powerful indictment of complacency and complicity in the face of rising authoritarianism and unmasked racism, Ilya Kaminsky is this year's recipient of the 2020 Annisfield Wolf Book Award for Poetry. We visited Ilya Kaminsky at his home in Atlanta, Georgia. You can just pretend I'm not here. Oh, okay. But you are here. <laughs> 
I was born in Odessa, a city in USSR, now Ukraine. At that time, it was still very much Soviet Union. When I was four, I had mumps, uh, which a Soviet doctor identified as a common cold and sent me back home. And that's how I lost, I lost much of my hearing. There was a child who saw the world through images. You're walking on a street and you can see people's lip move, but you also see the branches move. You also see the cats walk themselves on top of a car. The birds fly down on the branch and it's all a language. And you don't necessarily make a difference between the language of the birds flying and the language that you read in people's lips. You watch a lot of body language. You can see how when people are angry, they put their lips together in a different way. When people are tender, they look at each other in a different way. It's all a language. That's partly why I was drawn to poetry, because poetry is so much a language that shows instead of telling. Deaf Republic is a story of a pregnant woman and her husband in a time of crisis. At a public gathering, they see a soldier shoot and kill a young deaf boy. And in response to that murder, the whole town decides to protest by refusing to hear the authorities. And people, in fact, end up making up their own language, the language of science that articulates that protest, a language that authorities don't understand. He opens us up to this world, this imagined village where soldiers have taken over. And it is a, a scenario that you can see played out in many different ways, unfortunately, on the world stage. Michael Brown's body is still in the middle of the street. Trayvon Martin, an unarmed black teenager. Tania Rice, who was 12 years oh, old. Shot and killed by police. Oh, and the ways in which the townspeople valiantly try to resist and sometimes not so valiantly stand by. But in the middle of misfortune, in the middle of crisis, it's a story that tries to find tenderness, tries to find little moments of joy, because it's not all doom, 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 horror, horror, horror. Even in the middle of darkest things, people try to hold each other, try to tell each other, it's okay if you're gonna make it. The beautiful things about humans, there are many sad things about humans, but the beautiful thing about humans is our variousness. We are an interesting species. We are diverse species. What Ilya does in this book is open our eyes to the power of silence and also opens our eyes to the ways in which we tend to think of deafness as something that is lacking, as opposed to something that can be embraced. Deafness is something that is uh, often in the mainstream culture seen as a negative, something that's a misfortune. But it doesn't have to be. It's a wonderful, different perspective on the world. And why not, why shouldn't everybody be like deaf people? We live it happily during the war. We live it happily during the war. And when they bombed other people's houses, we protested. But not enough. We opposed them, but not enough. I was in my bed. Around my bed, America was fun. Invisible house by invisible house by invisible house. I took a chair outside and watched the sun. In a six month of a disastrous rain, in a house of money, in a street of money, in a city of money, in a country of money, our great country of money. Please forgive us. 
they would have to live during the war. Are you guys staying busy? Yeah, I'm too damn busy. I thought I was retired. <laughs> the current crisis in race relations in this country has kind of focused a lot of attention on the reconstruction period after the Civil War. Do you notice anything new this time around? The thing that struck me this year about what's been going on in the streets in our country is how widespread it is. I was astonished that the Black Lives Matter demonstrations in communities with hardly any black residents. In his most recent book, The Second Founding, How the Civil War and Reconstruction Remade the Constitution, Eric Foner warns his readers that rights can be gained and rights can be taken away. In the current American political moment, when voting rights and the very democracy that we fought for so long to secure are under dire threat. Foner's prolific scholarship on the Reconstruction era and its aftermath provides an essential basis for understanding the racial inflection point that we've reached in 2020. Foner's influence within the Academy is deep and broad, and his books have garnered every major prize in the field of history including the esteemed Bancroft Prize. But he's also a very public intellectual who takes the public's capacity for thoughtful engagement seriously. He's a Pulitzer Prize winner who's reached a vast audience as a learned editorial writer, engaging interview subject, and an historical consultant to a number of films and documentaries. In fact, to produce my own PBS documentary series on Reconstruction, I knew that I couldn't do this responsibly without enlisting Eric Foner's extraordinary expertise. And I was grateful when he accepted my invitation to serve as my senior scholarly advisor. Without understanding the myth surrounding Reconstruction's supposed failure, it's impossible to understand the violence that accompanied the restoration of white rule as part of an intentional strategy of domination that we now call white supremacy. Leading historians of the early 20th century supported the view that the South needed a redemption from the misrule of carpetbaggers and unfit black voters and office holders, with the major dissenter of this view being the great scholar William Edward Burkhardt Du Bois, who published Black Reconstruction in 1935. Other scholars followed Du Bois's lead, yet it wasn't until Eric Foner published his 1988 masterpiece, Reconstruction, America's Unfinished Revolution, 1863-1877, that the scholarly support of redemption was completely undermined. In this sense, Foner is Du Bois's intellectual grandson. Through his legendary work, Eric Foner shows us how the gains of Reconstruction were brutally halted just a dozen years after the end of the Civil War and then rolled back to usher in a nearly century-long era of Jim Crow segregation, with black voters disenfranchised, over 4,000 black men and women lynched, and separate but equal, codified as the law of the land. It is our obligation as American citizens to fight the rising tide of hatred that threatens to submerge the democratic principles on which this great country was founded. Eric Foner is one of our most brilliant leaders in this unending fight. For his lifelong dedication to social justice, for his passionate defense of racial equality, and for his truly invaluable scholarship that acknowledges the humanity in each and every one of us. Eric Foner is this year's recipient of the Annisfield Wolf Award for Lifetime Achievement. We visited Eric Foner at his home in New York City. Okay. 
Okay. This is where I do most of my writing, actually, just in this little, <laughs> this little office. It's unusually neat right now. And I have various sort of historical artifacts from various parts of my life. Any historian will be very happy when people say, your history helps me understand the present, because ultimately that's really what we're trying to do. My father was a historian. My uncle, Philip Fona, was a historian. I grew up in a family where there was a lot of just informal discussion of history at the dinner table and things like that. And moreover, this was the early 1960s. The country was going through a tremendous crisis, the civil rights revolution. The kind of history we've been taught, let's say in high school, could not explain what was happening in the country, which means it wasn't very good history. We were taught that all the problems had been solved, just a few little administrative tweaks were needed, and suddenly there were millions of people demanding their rights in the streets. Where did that come from? I was getting a different history at home than I was getting in school, which was a kind of interesting experience. My father was blacklisted the whole time I was growing up. He was among a fairly large group of teachers at the City University of New York who lost their jobs because of a legislative investigation of supposedly subversive communist elements in the City University teaching ranks. The communist war to destroy our nation. One of the charges against my father by an informant was that he spent too much time on black history. That showed that he wasn't really a very patriotic American. The 60s, when I was an undergraduate and then graduate student, was a pretty volatile time, and I certainly took part in the civil rights revolution going on. on campus. I just got involved in whatever was happening on campus, which at Columbia culminated in the student occupation of buildings in 1968. We have taken the power away from an irresponsible and illegitimate administration. But mostly civil rights issues. Those are the kind of things that were most meaningful to me. It's ironic that I did a lot of the research on my book on Reconstruction in what was called the Burgess Library. Burgess, John Burgess, was the founder of political science at Columbia, but deeply, deeply racist and wrote horrendous things about Reconstruction and the lack of civilization of black people and things like that. For many, many years, Reconstruction was seen as the lowest point in the history of the United States, but the reason supposedly was that African Americans were given the right to vote and take part in government, and they were just incapable of doing that. This is a view of history with direct relevance to the present. And a whole generation of younger historians like myself began to rethink that history. Well, I decided early on I wanted to write this book from the grassroots up. The struggles of former slaves, former slave owners, Klansmen, victims of the Klan, the day-to-day -day experience of Reconstruction, that was something I wanted to write about, but that meant I had to really dig into an immense amount of archival material. Although when I wrote that book there was no internet. No, I had to go out and do the research in the archives, in the libraries. People are better positioned to address the present if they have an idea where we came from, how we got here. There's no direct link between what happened in Reconstruction and what happened today, but the issues are still there. The Civil Rights Movement was often called the Second Reconstruction, the second time that the country sort of tried to come to grips with the consequences of the end of slavery. And I think we may be heading toward, I hope we are, a third Reconstruction, where some of these issues that have been agitated all this year are really addressed. It wouldn't have been surprising if someone had told me at the beginning of this year, well, a black man is going to be killed by the police and there will be demonstrations. Well, yeah, that happened many a time, sadly. And then they dissipate. It would have been very surprising if someone had said, but they won't dissipate, it will, it will continue. I'm tremendously impressed and inspired with what has happened this year in terms of people of all races, creeds, and ages demonstrating, but particularly the young, both black and white and others, taking to the streets over and over again in sustained demands for real substantive change in this country.
Yeah, it does remind me of the 1960s in many ways. One theme that seems to run through all my body of work is the whole question of freedom. We are the land of the free in the United States, at least that's what we tell ourselves, but freedom doesn't mean the same thing to each group of people. White Americans, by and large, think that freedom is something they have and somebody is trying to take away from them. African Americans think that freedom is something they are striving to achieve and haven't quite gotten there yet. No book in history, this is a sad fate we all have to suffer, no book on history is the final word. This is what I'm most proud of down here, actually. One, two, three, four shelves of books by former students of mine. Our fate is always to be superseded by some younger historian who comes along. They've all made a big mark on the study of American history um, over the years. This is from almost the very end of my book on Reconstruction. I had talked about the way that uh, generations of historians kind of misconceived Reconstruction as a time just of misgovernment and corruption, etc. And then I wanted to see what African Americans and their traditions thought of that period. Only in the family traditions and collective folk memories of the black community did a different version of Reconstruction survive. Growing up in the 1920s, Pauli Murray was, quote, never allowed to forget that she walked in proud shoes because her grandfather, Robert G. Fitzgerald, had fought for freedom in the Union Army and then enlisted as a teacher in what she called the Second War against the powerlessness and ignorance inherited from slavery. When the Works Progress Administration sent agents into the Black Belt during the Great Depression, to interview former slaves, they found Reconstruction remembered for its disappointments and betrayals, but also was a time of hope, possibility, and accomplishment. Bitterness still lingered over the federal government's failure to distribute land or protect black civil and political rights. The Yankees helped free us, so they say, declared 81-year-old former slave Thomas Hall, but they let us be put back in slavery again. Yet coupled with this disillusionment were proud, vivid recollections of a time when, quote, the colored used to hold office. Some pulled from their shelves dusty scrapbooks of clippings from Reconstruction newspapers. Others could still recount the names of local black leaders. They made pretty fair officers, remarked one elderly freedman. I thought them was good times in the country. Younger blacks spoke of being taught by their parents about the old times, mostly about the Reconstruction and the Ku Klux. I know folks think the books tell the truth, but they sure don't, one 88-year-old former slave told the WPA. And that comment by the former slave is about as devastating an indictment of the historical profession over generations in this country as you can possibly devise. They simply did not tell the truth. And in my own modest way, in my own work, that's what I've tried to do, tell the truth about slavery, the Civil War, and Reconstruction. We began this year's Annisfield Wolf Book Awards by taking a look back at our past, at the vision of Edith Annisfield Wolf. Her idea that literature can change lives is embodied this year in the creative impulse of Ramir Kirby, a young poet in Cleveland, Edith's hometown, and the hometown of the magnificent award that bears her name. My name is Ramir Kirby. I'm 11 years old. Everybody was contributing and then we made everybody ideas into one idea. It's about the city. 
yourself the good stuff I'm about to say. City not alone. City with windows for eyes. City offering a piece of bread with a bed. City with jazz and funk. City asking, what have I done? City wondering, what should I do? City saying, you should come too. City of homework. Observing city. Discovering city. City with athletic artists. City on water with a dash of heat. City that believes black lives matter. City asking for forgiveness. City with rock and roll. City in my life. City not alone. City like birds singing. City before I was born. Good city, we must keep clean. City asking skyscrapers what happened. City like one big house of words. Unusual city, energetic city, my city. Funding for the WVIZ PBS Idea Stream production of the Annisfield Wolf Book Awards 2020 was provided by the Cleveland Foundation.